Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. It's entitled Cell Culture Basics, Best Practices to Ensure High Performance and Reproducibility, presented by Mr. Steve Budd. Mr. Budd is a product specialist at ATCC. In this presentation, Mr. Budd will tap into ATCC's vast cell culture experience and share the best practices for culturing cells that ensure optimal results and performance. He will cover all aspects of successful cell culture, including culture initiation, expansion, authentication, and cryopreservation. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Steve Budd. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and service center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We're the world's largest, most diverse biological materials and information resource for cells and microbes, the gold standard, which leads us into the topic of today's webinar on cell culture fundamentals. In today's presentation, we're going to start with cell handling tips, focusing on cryopreservation, a septic technique and contamination, cell authentication, and issues with mycoplasma. We'll then discuss reasons for choosing certain cell types from primary cells to cell lines and finish with some points on transfection and cell viability. So we're first going to start with some cell and media handling techniques. So to start with thawing, when ready to thaw a vial of cells, the most important factor to note is that unlike freezing cells, thawing cells should be formed as quickly as possible to remove the cryoprotectant from the cells. For best results, place the valve in a 37 degree Celsius bath for approximately two minutes, gently agitating the valve to break up the ice. After removal from the bath, make sure to spray the valve with ethanol for decontamination. Transfer the contents to a sterile centrifuge tube with about nine mils of complete media which includes a cell culture medium and about 10% of FBS. When adding the growth media, pipette the liquid into the tube slowly in a dropwise fashion to avoid osmotic shock before adding the final full amount. When done, centrifuge the tube for 10 minutes at 125 Gs, discarding the supernated and resuspending one to two mils of growth media. Place the cells in the desired cell culture vessel with additional media. The main take home here is to thaw uh, cells as quickly as possible when placed in the water bath. Also note that for most primary cells, it is usually advisable not to centrifuge the cells as this could be detrimental to the cell health. Simply plate the cells after adding the additional growth media. So after thawing cells, they should be plated in an appropriate vessel, which could be cell culture dishes or flasks. This is all depending on your specific needs. For most cell types, the general accepted practice is to allow them to settle for about 24 hours after seeding. At this point, the cells should be checked for confluency, which is the percent coverage of cells over the surface of the vessel. If expanding cells, the ideal time to subculture is at approximately 80% confluency. The time it takes to reach this level can vary upon cell types. Primary cells can take several days or even up to a couple of weeks. The diagram gives a good visual of the different growth phases of cells in culture. When first plated, cells enter a lag phase where they grow slowly while trying to recover from the stress of subculturing. Cells then enter the exponential phase of growth. Here cells will grow exponentially as long as growth surface is available. When this surface is completely occupied, cells then enter the stationary phase of no growth. If they persist in this phase, they will then enter the decline phase, not shown in this graph, but to the right of the stationary phase. 
uh, at this phase, they will uh, lose viability and essentially die. To ensure phenotypic stability, cell lines need to be maintained in subcultures in the exponential phase. This will need this will need to occur before a cell monolayer becomes 100% confluent or reaches its maximum recommended cell density. As stated before, that ideal confluency is about 80%. So when you've reached 80% confluency, cells can be passaged with trypsin EDTA. Trypsin disrupts, disrupts the proteins involved in attaching cells to the culture vessel. The figure on the right shows a progression of cells being trypsinized. At the starting point, we see cells attached as a monolayer. After trypsin is added to the cells, they become flattened and more round. When completely detached, they can be seen floating around in clusters. This should take about three to five minutes but make sure to note that the dish should be gently agitated to help detach the cells, otherwise it could take longer. Long-term exposure of trypsin to cells can be detrimental, so the time in trypsin needs to be minimized. Also note that if using primary cells, a special lower concentration of formula of about 0.05% trypsin should be used. The lower concentration of trypsin will definitely require the physical agitation of the cell culture dish to ensure detachment. Also, when trypsinization is complete, the reaction needs to be quenched, ideally with a soybean neutralizing solution. Again, this will help protect the cells from any damage of long-term exposure to trypsin. In the next several slides, we want to discuss techniques on cryopreservation. I want to first go over the basic theory behind cryopreservation and how it works. So the freezing process is a complex phenomenon that's been studied for decades. Cellular metabolism stops when all water is turned to ice. This, however, is largely detrimental to the cell's health. Two main reasons for this, ice formation and an increase in solute concentration within the cell. This is caused by either freezing too quickly or too slowly. The solution to this problem is maintaining the ideal freezing rate while using a cryoprotectant, the most commonly, being, commonly used being DMSO. The combined effect will minimize ice crystallization and reduce the solute concentration effects. And the important take home here, as the diagram notes for most cells, the optimal rate of freezing is a drop of one to two degrees Celsius per minute. So freezing cells is typically a two-stage process in which cells are incubated for some time at minus 70 degrees Celsius before being stored at minus 140 degrees C. As previously discussed, cells must be cooled at a rate of about minus one degree Celsius per minute. This can be achieved with the use of a controlled rate freezer or controlled rate chambers. The length of time needed in the minus 70 would depend on the type of chamber used. So after spending the appropriate time at minus 70 degrees C, the vials must be transferred to minus 140 C for long-term storage. It's recommended to store cells in liquid nitrogen tanks for this purpose. So as I just stated, long-term uh, storage of mammalian cells require that cells be exposed to temperatures below minus 140 degrees Celsius. At these low temperatures, metabolic activity ceases, allowing for the preservation of cells for an indefinite period of time. For storing biological material at these low temperatures, it is highly advisable to use liquid nitrogen freezers. So there are two basic types of liquid nitrogen storage practices. One is immersing the valves directly in the liquid. The other involves holding the valves in the vapor phase above the liquid. Vapor phase systems create a vertical temperature gradient within the container. At the very bottom, where the liquid nitrogen resides, the temperature will maintain about minus 196 degrees Celsius. The temperature in the vapor nitrogen decreases as it reaches the top portion of the container. Enough liquid nitrogen should be used to guarantee that the warmest part of the container at the top is always at a temperature at or under minus 140 degrees Celsius. It is highly recommended that valves be stored in the vapor phase rather than the liquid. Since metabolic activity is arrested at minus 140 degrees C, the additional cold temperatures at the liquid phase offers no real advantage. However, immersing the material in the liquid phase 
runs the risk that some of the liquid nitrogen could penetrate the vials and cause them to crack or even burst. As we leave the discussion on cryopreservation, I want to discuss cell characterization as it relates to our upcoming topic of general cell health contamination and authentication. It is necessary to characterize cells to determine how healthy and viable they are, as well as making sure that they are the cells you think they are. Simple cell viability counts using Tripan Blue with the hemocytometer are an easy way to determine the percentage of live cells over dead cells. With this method, live cells appear to have bright centers while dead cells appear dark blue as the dye penetrates the compromised membrane. Often when researchers receive cells from collaborators or other unreliable sources, they may find that the cells are not exactly what they thought they were. So morphology is a quick way to distinguish broad cell types from one another. In the example on the right, you have two cell types, fibroblasts and Huvex. They have very distinct morphology. Fibroblasts tend to be elongated, whereas Huvex tend to have a rounded cobblestone appearance. Also, since different cell types grow at different rates, always make sure your cells are growing the way you would expect. If cells are contaminated with another fast-growing cell, the growth rate and doubling time may be greatly increased. We now come to the topic of contamination. So the main types of contamination we'll be concerned about are microbial, which include bacterial, mycoplasma, fungi, and virus. There's also cellular contamination, meaning one cell type or cell line has invaded another. We'll discuss this in a little more uh, detail shortly. So bacterial and fungal contamination are the most common problems seen in labs. They often appear quickly, but fortunately can be detected very easily. Turbid and acidic media usually indicate the presence of bacteria. Cell stress from microbial contamination may also lead to morphological changes in the cell type. Fungal contamination is seen by the appearance of obvious filamentous structures in the media. So at least one good thing about this microbial contamination is that it's very easy to detect quickly. Mycoplasma and cellular cross-contamination, uh, discussed in just a minute, is not as easy to detect. So what, where does contamination come from? For starters, anything that has been contaminated in the past can contaminate cells going forward. Media and reagents that are not handled correctly can easily be a vehicle to introduce bacterial and fungus into cell cultures. Using items such as petri dishes or pipette tips that are not properly sterilized can certainly introduce contaminants. Personnel can also introduce particulates and aerosols on personal clothing or even on dry skin. Improperly maintained equipment can prevent protection from the entry of contaminants. Overpacking autoclaves or ovens can even cause problems with uneven heating, creating pockets of non-sterile uh, supplies. Uh, the flow rate of hoods, if not properly adjusted, can allow particulates to enter. So what can you do to make sure cells and culture do not get contaminated? So I'm going to point out a few tips that should prevent contamination problems. First, in general, you want to make it hard for contaminants to enter your cell culture vessels. Small dishes, such as 35 to 60 millimeter dishes, can be placed in larger ones when in the incubator. Placing plates and dishes in larger ones are also ideal for transport. This adds an additional physical barrier that prevents particulars from entering. When using flasks, it is recommended to use vented caps that can be sealed tightly but still allow gas exchange. I always use disposable aspirators and pipette tips that are pre-sterilized. Make sure that your hood has adequate laminar flow and never overcrowd or leave materials such as boxes or bottles in the hood indefinitely. This can impede proper uh, flow and block attempts at cleaning and wiping down the hood surface. When bringing media and radius into the hood, I always spray the items down with alcohol to remove any contaminants. It is also advisable to bring in small amounts of reagents in the, into the hood at any given time. If possible, you may want to aliquot small amounts in these containers to reduce the number of times you're bringing a possible contaminant into the hood. For instance, if a vial is contaminated, at the very least, it will continue to enter the workspace. Always remember to wear 
clean uh, lab coats that cover most of your arms to prevent dust and shedding skin to contaminate your cultures. We advise not using antibiotics in culture. There are a few reasons in addition to the potential of, to of toxicity. If you use media with no antibiotics uh, and a contaminant enters your cell culture, chances are it will be visible within a couple of days. You can then discard the infected dishes. However, if there are antibiotics present, it may slow the growth of the contaminant, allowing further passages and freezing down your cell lines. In short, you may be saving large amounts of contaminated cells that can cause problems down the road. Resistant mycoplasma may also get introduced along with other bacteria. The antibiotics may get rid of the larger bacteria, but mycoplasma may persist undetected. Uh, so in short, uh, antibiotics can also sort of cause this sort of sense of false security. When is it acceptable to use antibiotics? So a few exceptions make it necessary. For instance, if you're isolating primary cells from original tissue, uh, it may be a good idea to use the antibiotics for the first couple of weeks. So mycoplasma contamination uh, is a separate uh, contamination issue that is extremely difficult to detect. So contamination from mycoplasma can cause a host of problems that includes altering the cell's function, uh, growth, morphology, causing chromosomal aberrations, affect nucleic acid synthesis, and changes in membrane antigens and gene expression. The main source of mycoplasma contamination is receiving infected cultures from other research laboratories. Reagents purchased commercially can also be a source of contamination. Mycoplasma contamination can be detected through a number of available kits in the market. The Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit from ATCC is a PCR-based kit that can detect 60 of the most commonly uh, identified micro mycoplasma species. So to put it in perspective, over 90% of contamination is caused in just a few species. The Mycoplasma Detection Kit comes with the specific primers that are unique to mycoplasma with mycoplasma DNA as a control. To test for mycoplasma, simply collect and lyse cells from your culture perform a touchdown PCR, and run the product on a gel. If the cell culture is contaminated, a band will appear at the same location as a positive control. Cross-contamination of one cell type with another is also a problem. If the, if the contamination is a particular fast-growing cell, the original cell line can be gradually replaced with the invading cells. As a result, an entire cell line in one's depository can be completely overwritten with a new cell. Furthermore, morphology is often not reliable enough to distinguish between the original and invading host, particularly if they're the same cell type, like one endothelial cell invading another endothelial cell. So there are a few common causes for this kind of contamination. Researchers can contaminate their own cell lines by working with multiple cell lines at a time. This often occurs when using the same pipette tips or aspirators with vessels containing different cell types. We recommend only working with one cell line at a time under the hood, if at all possible. Uh, more commonly, researchers receive cell lines from other labs or companies that were already cross-contaminated, so the importance of this cannot be understated. It has been estimated that 20% of scientific publications use misidentified cell cultures. Uh, this has also resulted in about 50% of preclinical research being non-reproducible. As a service, ATCC offers cell line authentication utilizing short tandem repeat profiling. STR profiling helps to detect misidentified, cross-contaminated, or genetically drifted cells, which invalidate research results. To take advantage of this service, simply receive a sample packet through the mail, spot cells onto a paper insert, and mail back. You will receive a short report that includes the STR profile of your cell line a comparison of your cells against an STR profile database, electropherograms supporting the allele cause at each loci, and a complete interpretation of the results. I also like to note that when you get back into the lab, now is a good time to start with freshly authenticated cells, and we do now offer human and mouse authenticated cells. So here I'm going to uh, change focus and go into how you can choose the best model. When we're talking about what which best cell model and, and why you would want to choose this. 
But before you go into that, I want to briefly discuss media uh, before you go into the models. So in general, continuous cell lines use a classical cell culture medium, such as DMM, RPMI, 1640, et cetera, uh, usually with 10% FBS. More specialized cell types like primary cells, H church cell lines, stem cells, uh, tend to require more specialized media. It is generally recommended to maintain cells in the same medium, but if transferring to a new medium, it should be done gradually with the 50-50 mix of old and new, eventually reaching the new medium entirely. ATCC does not recommend using heat-inactivated FBS under normal circumstances because it can denature growth factors necessary for the health of the cell. There are several types of cell models to choose from when designing your experiment, each with its own set of pros and cons. So let's start with the far right, the continuous cell lines. Continuous cell lines are often derived from a tumor. They're generally very easy to culture and have a low cost of culturing. They do not require a complex growth medium, usually just one of the classical cell culture formulations like DMM or RPMI supplemented with FBS. Like a tumor, they have great proliferative cap capacity. They all originate from a single clone, so there's minimal inter-experimental reproducibility. However, they are by nature abnormal cells with high instability and thus provide low in vivo predictability and limited biological relevance. The next model cell type that I would like to discuss is h turret immortalized cells. These cells are genetically uh, modified primary cells such that the cell no longer undergoes senescence. So what it's created is a cell with continuous cell-like growth characteristics, but primary cell physiology. This means high proliferative capacity, and since every H. tert cell type originates from a single transfected clone, there's no inner experimental variability. Every lot will be virtually identical. Since the starting material is a normal primary cell, there is greater genetic stability with near normal primary physiology. So therefore, high predictability and high bio biological relevance. The third cell type is an induced pluripotent stem cell derived primary cell or IPSC derived primary cell. The cell type is derived from a somatic cell line that is dedifferentiated to an embryonic state and then differentiated to a specific primary cell line lineage using a specific cocktail of growth factors. IPSC derived primary cells are usually generated from a single clone, so there's likely little worries regarding the introduction of biological variability. The main problem with stem cell derived cells is that they are differentiated in the immature primary cell types, so not the best for predictability or biological relevance. Lastly, we'll discuss the cell type that is the best model for in vivo predictability and biological relevance, the primary cell. A primary cell is usually isolated from normal adult tissue, so no genetic instability. However, for large-scale screening, there is a potential problem, not enough cells from a given donor. The use of new donors will introduce biological variability in your experiments. So each um, uh, model has its own strengths and weaknesses. However, as you move from basic research to more clinical-like applications, you need to choose a model that most positively matches up to your research needs. As a final note regarding choice of cell model, Continuous cell lines are derived, again, from a tumor or mutated in some fashion, such that the cell has deviated from its original source. So in every experiment involving continuous cell lines, the corresponding primary cell should be run as a control. That way, if you observe a specific effect on your experiment, you can, be, you can uh, ensure the results are valid and not an artifact of the tumor or mutation. So the take home is use primary cells as controls when at all possible. Okay, we're going to switch gears again and talk a little bit about transfections and, and what transfection reagents uh, you can use. So I'm going to discuss the basic method of lipid-based transfection. Since so transfection is a method for introducing exogenous nucleic acid sequences into cells, there are various ways to accomplish this. One of the most common is lipid-mediated transfection. 
Lipid media transfection is the most accessible and usually the simplest me method available. It's based upon the idea that opposites attract. The transfection reagent is a cationic lipid that forms micelles with a net positive charge. Nucleic acids have a net negative charge, allowing the formation of complexes of lipid and DNA. The nucleic acid is covered by the micelle, so the complex now has a net positive charge on the outside. The surface of a cell has a net negative charge, so the complex moves to the surface and binds to the cell membrane. The nucleic acid lipid complex can now move through the cell's lipid, lipid membrane, allowing the nucleic acid to enter the cell cytoplasm. The nucleic acid then enters the nucleus and the gene product can be expressed. ATC supplies two lipid reagents for transfection, GeneX Plus and Transfex. Transfex is our all-purpose reagent working well with continuous cell lines and primary cells. As suspension cells are a bit more challenging for transfection, we often find that GeneX Plus offers higher transfection efficiency for these, for these suspension cells. So it's very easy to actually set up a lipid transfection uh, process. And here we're just, I'm going to go through a simple workflow to demonstrate this. You always want to transfect cells when they're in the exponential growth phase. So you seed your cells uh, to be ready the day before you plan to, to, you, to do your transfection experiments. On transfection day, which is day zero on the slide, you combine your DNA with your lipid reagent and, now the, and allow the complexes to form. Then you can add the complexes to your cells so that you see it on day minus one. It's at the very top of the chart. You should then be able to detect, detect protein expression at about 24 to 72 hours post-transfection. So now we're going to sort of talk about uh, transfection best practices and how to optimize culture conditions. And these are four things to take into consideration. So even though it is a fairly straightforward protocol, uh, these, there are several aspects of the process that you need to be optimized to ensure the highest potential, uh, the possible transfection efficiency. To achieve a good transfection, the health of your cells is of utmost importance. The cells, cells should preferably be at a low passage number. If they're exceeded too high or too low of a density, the metabolic rate can be negatively affected and cells could find the complex as toxic or may not readily express the gene product of interest. Contamination can lower the observed transfection efficiency, especially if it's mycoplasma. If you ever observe a drop in efficiency with the transfection protocol that has been, optimized, that has been previously optimized, mycoplasma contamination may be a likely reason. Media used during the transfection process is also a consideration. Certain lipids require no or low serum during the transfection process, so always follow the lipid manufacturer's guidelines. So a little bit more on transfection best practices. So for nucleic acids, which are DNA or RNA, one should use high purity and endotoxin-free material to achieve the highest transfection efficiency possible. Endotoxin appears to lower transfection efficiency. For DNA, one should verify promoter strength for the given cell being transfected. Certain promoters are known to work better with certain cell types. Plasma size is also a concern. The larger the plasmid, the lower the expected transfection efficiency. You should also verify that you, you are using a complete sequence in your plasmid. DNA plasmas that have been stored for some time can become degraded or nicked. So when designing your transfection experiment, you need to determine what assay methods you will employ at the timing for the data collection. As your protein of interest is expressed, you can use real-time PCR to detect RNA, probably uh, 18 to 48 hours post-transfection. If this is your first time working with proteins, I would suggest running a time course analysis at a few different time points. If you plan to detect at the protein level, you need to give the cells enough time to make your protein and then perform any analysis for the, for, uh, for the protein is turned over. If you are not sure of your protein's half-life in the cell, again, a time course analysis is warranted. 
So, of course, depending on the nature of your protein, there may be additional functional assays you can run. However, I would always recommend running analysis at the genomic and protein level, at least uh, until optimal transfection parameters have been established. So regarding transfection reagents, there are three main areas of concern. First, which lipid should I use? That would depend on the cell type you're using and the cell characteristics. As I just mentioned, certain lipids are generally uh, geared towards cell suspension, like ATCC's GenX+. Other considerations involve what are you trying to deliver to the cells. Certain lipids are for DNA. Others may be designed to work with RNA or small proteins. Next, you often have to optimize the ratio of lipid to DNA for the cell type and substrate that you're working with. Most manufacturers will, will, uh, will provide guidelines, but some optimization should be expected. Lastly, one should optimize the incubation time for the lipid that in contact with cells. If you're using a low or no serum transfection medium, you do not want to leave the cells in the media for too long, and some complexes can become toxic to cells. So again, most suppliers will provide guidelines, so by, uh, optimization may be required for your specific conditions. And so this is the very last slide on transfection, and I'm just going to summarize best practices on the transfection section of this talk. So to achieve optimal transfection efficiency, use healthy cells and the exponential growth. Free of contamination, DNA that is of high purity and intertoxin-free. And the recommended lipid for each cell type and substrate should be determined. Every uh, setup may require some optimization, including but not limited to seeding density of cells and the ratio of lipid to substrate. And so now we're going to move to the last major topic of this discussion, and this is going to be viability assays. So to cover growth and viability, uh, we want to discuss ways of actually measuring the number of cells in a cell culture vessel and determine the proliferation or growth rate. This is ideal for assays in which you want to compare normal growing cells against an exponential, uh, I guess an experimental factor that would positively or negatively affect the growth. So these two assays that we offer, uh, MTT and the XTT cell proliferation kits, uh, utilize tetrazillium salts to deliver a quantitative analysis of cell numbers. So this slide is a diagram that shows how this works inside of a cell. So you can imagine the blue sphere, spheres are cells, uh, and the gray inner sphere is, being, is going to be the nucleus. So with the MTT assay, the tetrazolium salt is introduced into the cell. Naturally occurring oxidation reactions within the cell, uh, which is indicative of normally growing cells, will reduce the tetrazolium interformazin. So the cells are then lysed with detergents, releasing the formazin, giving off a purple color. The more purple the media, the more metabolically active and growing the cells will be. So this assay is good for measuring things like cellular toxicity and apoptosis. And the XCT reaction on the right is very similar, but the reaction takes place at the surface and it gives off an orange color as an indicator. From a more practical point uh, or a point of comparison, uh, so both assays are designed for 96 well plates. And here we have an overview of what the, uh, these assays are going to look like. So for both, they're plated with, a, in this example, with a cytotoxic test compound. With the MTT reagent at the top, there's an incubation period to allow the reagent to enter the cell. The detergent is added, allowing for the compound to be released in the media. At this point, it can take a few more hours for the reaction to complete. With the XCT reaction, the XCT reagent and activation agent are added at the same time, so the reaction starts immediately. So one just practical benefit of the XCT kit over the MTT is there's one less step in the protocol, which will knock off you know, a couple of hours from the whole process. And so this graph shows an example of absorbance versus cell number when comparing the MTT kit and the XCT kit. The XCT is in the blue at the top. The MTT and the red at the bottom. So in this case, eventually the absorbance will saturate and no longer indicate the number of cells as the number of cells increase in your plate. So the reading will be the, the reading is taken on the growth curve. So this shows that with the XCT kit, it's more sensitive than the MTT, and that they can read cells between 5,000 to 30,000 cells. 
So with the MTT, the reading is between 5,000 and 15,000 cells. So the XCT assay, um, because of its fewer steps in the protocol and its increased sensitivity, is generally considered to be a more sophisticated assay. And so now for the, this is where we're reaching the end, and this is just one last summary on everything that we've talked about. So as a summary of what we've discussed, uh, remember to use best practices to eliminate contamination while ensuring optimal growth and storage. In your cell culture workflow, choose the best model for your needs. Cell lines for standardization and primary cells as optimal controls that maintain biological relevance. Each turn to more live cells can be the best of both worlds with continuous growth and prim primary cell characteristics. And so the key to good transfection practices rely on the use of healthy cells, purified substrates, and optimization of the lipid to substrate ratio. Lastly, you can monitor cell health and viability with the MTT and HTT viability assays. And that concludes uh, this webinar on basic cell culture handling. And I will turn it over to Dr. Shapiro uh, for further announcements. Well, thank you, Steve. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please remember to use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. And it looks like Mike Utaro, one of our technical service representatives, has joined in. Uh, welcome, Mike. Hi, great to be here again. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and start with our first question. Um, and I'm going to send this one Mike's way. Uh, can we use contaminated cultures after treating them with antibiotics? Okay, so generally speaking, it's never really recommended to use cells after they've been contaminated. Uh, so not only is it kind of difficult to get rid of contamination in cultures, uh, the cells may have been physiologically compromised from exposure to the contaminant, and treatment can be very harsh on cells too, which can affect viability. So it's generally better just to discard cultures, start fresh when you do experience a contamination. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, when in doubt, uh, bleach it out, right? <laughs> mm hmm exactly. All righty. Uh, and then um, what are some of the main reasons uh, that cells may unexpectedly detach from plates? And, and this one, again, I'll, I'll shoot Mike's way. Okay, that's a good question. So uh, there are definitely a number of reasons uh, that can cause cells to detach unexpectedly. Most often, this is going to be due to suboptimal sub medium pH, uh, incorrect buffering from an imbalance in the CO2 percentage in the incubator and the amount of sodium bicarbonate that's present in the basal media. So in that respect, uh, most of the ATCC formulated basal media will contain 1.5 grams per liter of sodium bicarbonate, which is used for 5% CO2. Uh, most other vendors are going to use 3.7 grams per liter of sodium bicarbonate. Uh, that's going to require a higher level of CO2, 10%. And so a lot of times, uh, I definitely noticed in tech as well, that um, a lot of cell detachment can happen because of that imbalance in pH from sodium bicarbonate and CO2 levels. And then also cell detachment can be caused by overconfluent high density of the cells in the flask. Uh, too many cells, and they can start lifting off of the flask due to lack of stuff substrate for the cells to attach to. Uh, and then finally, you've got the concentration and time of exposure of dissociation enzymes, such as trypsin, uh, used during the subculture. So incomplete inactivation uh, or removal of these dissociating enzymes uh, and cell clumping that forms from that can also delay and affect cell attachment later on down the line. All right, great. Uh, 
So this next question um, is around mycoplasma. So I'm going to send it Steve's way. Um, so Steve, how many samples can be run with the mycoplasma detection kit? Sure. Um, the kit that we offer, the, the universal mycoplasma detection kit, is designed, if you follow the procedure, to run about 12 samples. Uh, there are uh, 40 reactions total in the kit. Uh, but then we have, you know, we, we we recommend that you run three times, and we have some controls and so forth, positive and negative and, and negative control, and so yeah, that, that sort of takes up a lot of the reaction. So 12 samples with a total of about 40 reactions in the kit. All right. Um, now for the uh, the next couple of questions that have come in all seem to be around um, cell freezing and cryopreservation. Uh, the, the first one I'm going to go ahead and send to Steve because it's product specific. Um, so can you keep a freezing container such as the cool cell uh, for long periods in minus 80 for like several days, weeks, months? I mean, how long really can you leave it in the freezer for? Um, it's designed to go uh, to um, solely freezer cells at about a minimum of four hours in the minus 70, minus 80. Uh, it can go as long as overnight safely, but anything more than that, you're in the risk of causing possible cell damage. So after that, you would want to put it in the liquid nitrogen, in the vapor phase liquid nitrogen. Um, so you know, so it's designed so that if you if you're freezing down your cells in the morning, um, you know, you can put them in in the minus 80 in the in the cool cell for a few hours, four hours as I stated. Then you can uh, put them in the liquid nitrogen, or if you're doing it later in the afternoon, you can let it go overnight. So it's sort of it's convenient that way. But four hours to you know roughly 24 hours, or I should say overnight rather than 24 hours, so four hours or, or overnight, which is about 12 hours or more, a little bit more. Okay. <clears throat> All right, good, good. Uh, now, this next question may actually bear a, a little bit of discussion, okay? So, does, li does the liquid nitrogen tank with the stored cells in it have to be filled almost to the top, or, or maybe task it's a different way do the cell culture racks um, within the nitrogen storage unit need to be above or below the liquid nitrogen level? Uh, if that's for me, yeah. Um, oh. If you want to handle that, by all means, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, um, and, and Mike can add to it, but uh, uh, definitely it should not be completely full of liquid nitrogen. The cells... Uh, should be stored in the in the vapor phase, which is um, above the actual liquid nitrogen. And largely the reason for that is when uh, vials are stored actually physically in liquid nitrogen, they can cause um, you can get if, if you have any imperfections in the plastic, it can cause them to basically you know a, a, the gas could ex when you take it out of the liquid nitrogen, it can cause it to actually explode and could cause damage or harm to to the user so it should be filled in the liquid nitrogen phase that is definitely cold enough for the for the purposes needed right right and then you know there's there's another issue as well right i mean who here has pulled out um you know uh a, 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 a several racks um from liquid nitrogen um all at once what ha you know, and the and the liquid nitrogen is filled to the top. You have all this liquid nitrogen is basically wasted. It gets dumped on the floor. You know, people can kind of flip on it. You can burn yourself on it, right? So, so there's a safety mm -hmm. issue there, as well as you know, your precious samples could get <laughs> blown up and contaminated, right? Correct. Exactly. It just yep. Vapor phase is more than cold enough. Definitely don't want to go submerge all the way inside if you can avoid it. Right, right. And then, um, you know, kind of, kind of next in line after that. Um, how long 
is the cell line um, viable when it's stored in liquid nitrogen? So, like, say you get a cell line from ATCC and you can't thaw it and grow it immediately, and you're like, ah, I got to put it in liquid nitrogen immediately, right? How long can it be stored there without losing its uh, viability? Uh, is uh, indefinite. Liquid nitrogen storage. Yes. Yeah, indefinite. That's exactly it. Just um, stored correctly, make sure that the liquid nitrogen is still topped off at a good level. Um, they'll keep indefinitely. Okay, good, good. And that is in contrast to storing it at minus 80, right? Which is four to mm -hmm. four hours to overnight. Exactly. And that's just for, yeah, like at the beginning of crowd preservation during that slow thaw, um, that one, my one degree per minute uh, slow thaw of, I'm sorry, slow freeze that we want. Um, yeah, four hours to overnight at minus 80 is really kind of the upper limit that we recommend. And then liquid nitrogen long term. Uh, kept there, they will keep indefinitely. All right, good, good. So, wow, we've had we've had a ton of questions come in. By the way, um, let's uh, jump to the next one. And um, actually, the next couple, it, it seems like they're coming in in groups, so this is kind of helpful uh, by topic. So, is there any advantage? to neutralizing trypsin with soybean trypsin inhibitor versus 10% uh, growth media? So there's not an advantage per se. Um, for a lot of cell lines that are using serum-free media, such as the uh, keratinocyte serum-free media from Gibco that we use with some of our cells, um, Complete media is not going to have serum that's going to inactivate the cell, uh, the trypsin rather. So soybean trypsin inhibitor inhibitor would be recommended there. Um, there's no real advantage, so so to say. It's just that uh, you would want to avoid using uh, serum with cells that are serum free. Okay. And yeah, the following question asked, um, can you use fresh media instead of um, SDI? Yep, Sorry, definitely. Uh, yep. Yep. So fresh media, definitely. You just want to make sure that your media contains uh, serum, photo, uh, fetal bovine serum, bovine calf serum, horse serum, uh, some sort of serum that's going to inactivate the trypsin. Um, otherwise, it's, you know, just still in not inactivated and unless you remove it really well through centrifuge, uh, centrifuging, it could cause attachment effects later on. All right, good, good. Now, um, let's see, uh, of course, you know, in science, um, the answer to any question might be, I don't know, and that's a perfectly fair answer. Um, yeah. Steve, Mike, um, Either you guys, do you have any um, tips for cryopreservation of tissue engineered scaffolds? Ooh, that is a good one. Um, mm. So tissue in general is something we don't have a lot of experience with cryopreservation. Um, as far as Scaffolds, I mean, the, you may be able to freeze them in a way that's similar to our organoid products, um, but unfortunately, I I don't have any experience to offer in terms of um, tissue, so to say. Yeah, I, I think I everything we've ever done with any kind of cell culture, the 3D models that involve scaffolding or co-culture, and we've, you know, we've... We've always thawed and frozen. It. Like, I guess it's, it's always been an endpoint for us for every application we've done. So we've done any kind of model like that. It's we've never frozen down after that. So I would agree with my. I don't think we have that much experience with anything other than you know organoids or cells um, of that nature. And I guess it would really depend on what exactly is meant by tissue scaffold, or how or how big it is, how big is your sample, or, or whatever the case may be. So, okay. unfortunately, yeah, I, I don't have much to say about that either. Yeah, no problem. Let, 
like I said, I don't know. Occasionally is absolutely the right answer. Um, so, all right. Um, for this next question, this is around um, uh, cell density for suspension cells. Right, so for a suspension cell such as say 293F, what's the cell density um, that uh, the cells reach the stationary phase? Or how do you keep from getting okay. to the stationary phase, basically? <laughs> okay, so for a lot of our uh, suspension lines, um, Generally, the hard limit is going to be 10 to the 6 cells per milliliter. Um, the easiest way to, you know, keep cells from going into that lag phase of growth is to uh, continuously re uh, refresh the media, add fresh media to the suspension cultures, um, keeping them within a density of, uh, it's going to vary from cell line to cell line, but for uh, the suspension 293 cells, it uh, looks like, uh, between the range of 100 to 300,000 viable cells per milliliter, uh, keeping them within that range and not letting them go above 10 to the 6 cells per milliliter should keep them actively growing. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, good. That's good. Now, um, here's, a, here's an interesting question around transfection. And um, either of you can take this. Um, I like to have my cultures above 90% viability leading up to transfection. What would be the best way to increase viability for newly thawed cells that haven't um, reached that uh, viability, that greater than 90%? So, I have my idea. So, yeah, so especially at thaw, like newly thawed cells, it's definitely not uncommon for cells to take a little bit of extra time. Um, there's no kind of magic bullet I could, I can think of anyways for, you know, uh, guaranteeing that increase in viability, uh, how you handle the cells, how often you handle the cells, uh, the media, if there's no issues there. Um, the cell density, these are all things that could affect recovery, uh, from, especially from thaw. Uh, time and care is kind of what I would recommend is, um, you know, it may take some extra time for the cells to reach 90% viability or high enough viability for you to do your transfection uh, experiments. But um, unfortunately, there's no real like magic bullet that we can say that will boost viability guaranteed at the start of the culture. Yeah, the only yeah, thing I, I can mean, say is, oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, thaw relatively quickly. You know, you want to thaw whatever cells you have in a vial. Thaw them. Don't let them, I guess a better way of saying is like if you're using a water bath, don't let it sit in the water bath any longer than it needs to. So just be as quickly quick about removing it from the from the stored vial. As, as soon as as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um. I, yeah. That's a, that's good advice, Steve. Uh, also. Um. And I mean, you gotta let them recover, right? So they've been mm -hmm. frozen. You've woken them up. You know, it's just just like all of us when we first wake up and need a couple cups of coffee, right? Um, and, oh yeah. And also, <laughs> in the past, I've I've always passaged the cells. Uh, a couple of times before I started using them in experiments. One, to expand them a little bit so I had enough to use for the experiments. And and two, just to give them that that, that time to uh, recover to increase their viability. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my two cents. Yeah, it sounds okay. to me like what the, what the question is asking for is um, something like, I mean, it sounds like he wants to thaw it and immediately go to his transfection experiment, and that, I guess, that's not really recommended. Um, yet, like like I think both of you said, it's, it needs to, at the very least, rest for some time, and, and at least, if not passage, it, at least let it grow. Yeah, I guess it depends on the cell type, because some cells grow very slowly, but at least let it maybe grow up to 90% confluent, if you're going to do for your transfection, or whatever the recommended confluency is for that particular cell type. Right, right. right. 
All right. So um, ah, this this next question is a very good question, um, and I'll uh, I'll send it to Mike to start off with. Would you recommend um, using different bottles of reagents for different cell lines to prevent cross contamination? That is definitely something that could be recommended. It could be a little bit of overkill. Um, separate aliquots can definitely help. You just don't want to use the same aliquot for the same for the same uh, for two different cell types. So you know, if both cells require DMEM, uh, ten percent FBS. Don't use that same aliquot of DMEM and ten percent FBS when you're handling both both media. They should have their own separate aliquots that never intermingle with one another. Yeah, de definitely. I, I would agree with that. Aliquot your media. Um, otherwise, you know, you're you run the risk of your cell lines being uh, contaminated. Possibly with a faster growing cell. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly, and that's how HeLa spread everywhere. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Top of mind, huh? Okay. okay. So, um, for this next question, um, I guess I'll send it Steve's way. Um, if the cell line is found to be contaminated with mycoplasma, is there a way to address this, or is it best to discard? Um, we yeah we get that question a lot I think um, our recommendation is always to discard that we don't there are products on the market that claim that say you could you treat cells with um, if you treat cells with with it um, it can remove the microplasma contamination uh, I don't think I, I've I, I don't know that we've ever validated any ones that do. we don't we do not offer any kind of product like that our recommendation has always been to to discard if you if you have discovered uh, mycocontamination, unless these are some particularly rare cell line that you can't, you know, reestablish or, or get again. Um, yeah, we always recommend to discard. Same thing with any kind of uh, contamination, to be honest. I think Brian said it earlier, when, what, when, what did you say, Brian? <laughs> when in doubt. When in doubt, just, bleach it out. <laughs> I'll bleach it out. There you go. I remember that. Yeah. And, and and then kind of as a follow up, how often should you check for mycoplasma contamination? Uh, we generally recommend after several passages. If you if you have an established line and you're passaging it, maybe after several passages, maybe up to ten. Um, test for it if you if you come across a new uh, cell line from someone other than a reputable source. Um, like at ATCC, we always check for for micro for non contamination, so it always anything we sell is going to be negative. But if you're getting a cell line from someone else and you're not sure, um, always always test for micro to begin with. And also, if you've had cell lines in you know frozen down that you haven't worked with in a while and you don't you can't you're not sure when the last time it was used or when who froze it down. So when you're starting a new cell line from, from from the liquid nitrogen, or if it's been passed ever several times, it's been you know somewhere between five and ten. Um, but five might be a bit much. Um, it's a roughly ten. I think ten would be good. But every ten passes, every time you every ten passes would be good. And also, if you're if you're going to whenever you authenticate cells, it's always a good day. That's a good time to check for micro as well because. It's convenient to do it then because you're, you can use the same, you know, give them the same source, the same your same sample source. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, I guess while we're at it, um, and just because another question came in, how often should you authenticate your um, cells using um, STR profiling? Yeah, kind of the same, kind of the same thing. Uh, but every ten passages, so to make sure there hasn't been significant genetic drift. Um, whenever you get a new cell line from, uh, you know, a, a non-commercial source that has that has uh, that has not been validated, um, and whenever and then whenever you're pulling from, you know, a cell line that you've worked with in the past but it's been frozen down for a while, so kind of the same same answer as the micro. Yep, yep, that sounds good. All right. Um, 
this next one I'm going to send Mike's way. Uh, how should the incubator be cleaned or disinfected if bacterial contamination occurs? Okay, so there are definitely a few ways to go about it. So a lot of incubators nowadays are going to have some sort of uh, sterilization cycle that can be run that will definitely help out. Um, bleach, cleaning out, making sure uh, if you're able to take out any of the metal components, autoclave those as well. Um, yeah, no, making sure that all air intakes are clean as well. Um, yeah, bleach, autoclaving, any shelvings, uh, and letting the incubator, especially, uh, you know, if the incubator has that auto uh, sterilized function, letting that run can definitely help. Okay. Good, good. Um, all righty. Uh, Mike, do you have any insight as to how many cells you should freeze per mill, mill rather, when you're cryopreserving cells, or does it vary greatly? Um, so it does vary. I'm not so sure about greatly. Uh, so there's definitely going to be things that you want to take into account when you're preparing your own cryopreserved stocks. Uh, you know, the vessel that you're going to start the cells into, if it's a larger vessel, you may need more cells per vial. If it's a smaller vessel, you may want to have less cells per vial. Um, you know, get good cell counts of when you do passage your cells so you have an idea of how many cells that you can expect at confluence. So that can definitely help guide your um, how many cells that you freeze per vial. And then if you're completely unsure, a good rule of thumb is always to uh, check the COA uh, for the lot that you receive from ATCC, um, freezing the similar amount of cells uh, as we do on the COA. Uh, it's definitely a, it's a good starting point if you're unsure of how densely you should be freezing your cells, but the COA is definitely a good place to start. Okay. Now, um, basically, I'm paraphrasing. We had several questions come in over this general theme of what's the maximum number of passages a cell line can go through before it's time to let it go? Oh, uh, so um, 10 passages is generally what we recommend. Um, 10 passages uh, before you revert to a lower passage stock. Uh, that is to prevent things like genetic drift or inadvertent selection of a subpopulation of cells, things like that. Um, you know, we have confirmed for some of our HTERT lines, um, they're able to grow for extended amounts of times. Uh, you know, if you are going to keep them in passage that long, authentication is going to be key for sure. But 10 passages is a good general rule of thumb that we recommend. All right, good, good. Let's see. Um, I'm just sort of cherry picking through here because we've had about 50 questions come in. Um, let's see. Uh, can you comment on testing for mycoplasma um, from culture media? versus from cell pellet? Is one source more sensitive than the other? Okay, so um, with mycoplasma, they actually type to attach to the cells. Uh, and so that's why for our mycoplasma kit, we actually have, um, you know, whole cells that are then lysed and then tested from that. Um, you may not get as strong of a signal from just media. You're going to want to, um, you know, as our kit recommends, lysing cells and then running that on PCR using our primers. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention that our kit does does recommend, um, yeah, using actual cells rather than just media. It's possible, but like to, to it certainly is possible to detect it. But you're not if you don't detect it, you're not going to be 100 percent sure. It's like like Mike said it. The mycoplasma does pretty much tend to adhere to the cells themselves. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> this next question is um, a little bit tricky and um, <clears throat> a little bit more information might be needed to, to really get a clear answer, but can cell line identification such as STR detect fibroblast contamination in a primary cell line? I have some ideas about it this, but um, I'll let you guys go ahead, uh, maybe Steve. Are you saying, are you saying, sorry, this question, can you, de can you detect, like, contamination from another here's, cell type with STI yeah, or profiling? Right, right. Here's two scenarios, okay? The first scenario is if you're, um, you're just culturing a whole mess of different cells in your laboratory, right? And um, you contaminate uh, primary epidermal keratinocytes with a um, fibroblast cell line from different donors. Could you mm -hmm. detect um, that contamination? Okay, so that um, different donors should be able to, like, it's going to be, I think it's 25% for the, uh, is the amount that is needed to be present in the culture for it to be detected. But uh, if it's from the same donor, uh, like if you're working with tissue and you're concerned about fibroblast contamination in, like, uh, let's say, uh, epithelial cell, primary cell cultures, uh, if it's from the same donor, it's going to have the same STR profile, and so it would not be able to be picked up like that. Exactly, exactly. So that yep. was the second scenario that I was going to um, throw out there, and so Mike, you, you totally anticipated that. <laughs> um, okay, what's a way that you could detects fibroblast contamination. Ooh. I have no idea. Um, fibroblast markers. So I, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's what I was going to say, yeah. This is for the, for the specific fibro, um, um, a surface marker is specific to your, to your contamination or suspected contamination. Okay. Cool, cool. Now, I have sort of a Schrodinger's box question for you guys. Um, are there any chances of contamination in a liquid nitrogen <clears throat> tank if different cell lines are stored in the same tank? I want to say no. Yeah, I don't. If you, so can you <laughs> contaminate? Can, you can one vial can you contaminate vials by just storing them in the same tank? Is that what you're asking? Yep. Yeah, I I don't see how that's really possible. Yeah, yep. I mean I, the cells would need to travel out <laughs> of the yeah there swim through. It's not it, it it's not <laughs> easy for cross contamination yeah. to occur. Yeah, I would, I would definitely I would rule that out that. if you had contamination in your sample. I'm sure it would be something else. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, there there's a lot of questions about mycoplasma that have come in. Um, but one of them is, um, so say you you bought some cells from ATCC or another reputable source. Um, you know, the cells came from the uh, manufacturer mycoplasma negative. How could you introduce mycoplasma into the cultures? So mycoplasma is everywhere. Um, hmm. The most obvious, uh, I don't want to say obvious, but the most common way for mycoplasma to be introduced into cultures is going to be lapses in aseptic technique. Um, pipette tips, brushing up against anything, um, not realizing that your gloved hand uh, brushed up against an aspiration needle or something like that. Um, just minor lapses like that are going to be the main way that mycoplasma is going to be introduced to cell cultures. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And possibly, um, if your if your uh, biological cabinet isn't the flow isn't 
working properly, you know, have good flow that could allow any kind of contamination to get in. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the source is almost definitely going to be from not using a septic t technique and coming from the individual or individuals doing the actual culture, most likely. Yep, yep. I I'd, I'd agree with all that. I'd agree with all that. Okay. Um, now this next question, um, I'm going to shoot Steve's way. Uh, after H tert immortalization of primary cells. Is it necessary to validate their previous characteristics? And um, how would you go about doing it? Validate their previous characteristics. Um, yeah, I, I would, depending upon the cell type, I would, yeah, I would validate it with um, surface markers very similar to what we do with primary cells. And that's, we indicate what we what they're positive for, negative for on the individual, whatever that cell type is. Um, there's that. There's morphology, of course, and to verify that the morphology is, you know, if it's a fibroblast, it looks like a fibroblast. If it's an epithelial cell, it looks like an epithelial cell, and so forth. So morphology and uh, general growth characteristics. And that's a major thing. Is it growing? At the or you know is it, is it yeah is it growing at the speed that it should grow is it growing too fast or too slow and so forth um, yeah do you have anything to add to that Brian anything that you can yeah I mean you know I, you can stain for the appropriate markers um, to to make sure that they're present um, you could uh, grow them up and then see if they will you know say keratinocytes. Um, turn right, functional again. assays, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah functional exactly. assays. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we've done that with a lot of our cells, mm -hmm. right? So, yes. you know, we've, we've um, functionally characterized the uh, uh, RP tech cells and then the RP tech derivatives with uh, that overexpressed OAT1, 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 OAT3, not 2. I don't know why that mm -hmm. was top of, line, of my mind, but there you go. Um, and, and we've done that with the h turn immortalized keratinocyte. Um, and yeah, pretty much uh, just about everyone that comes through, we um, we try and at least um, stain for the appropriate markers. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, yeah, functional testing. That's 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 kind of the way to go, I would say. Yep, yeah, I'd um, agree. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's see. What else do we have here? Um. Uh, here's an interesting question. I don't know if any of you guys um, would care to elaborate about this, but um, this one's about HTERT inactivated FDS. So, A, could you reiterate a little bit about the risk of it? And um, also, what about gamma irradiated FDS, or is just standard premium FDS sufficient? Okay. So, it's not really a risk per se to using heat inactivated serum. Um, the biggest issue with heat inactivation, if, excuse me, heat inactivation of serum is that so heating up serum to 56 degrees for half an hour that is going to denature uh, some of the attachment growth factors that are present in the serum. It may not be as nutritious as normal serum. Uh, and heat inactivation generally is only needed if you need to inactivate a complement that's found in the cell, I'm sorry, in the serum that could have uh, negatively react with the cells in culture. Um, because the other primary use for heat inactivation, which was uh, mycoplasma, um, concerns about mycoplasma, uh, it's not really a much of a concern because all FPS nowadays is triple filter to remove any possible contamination. So heat inactivation uh, for mycoplasma concerns is no longer a real issue. So if you're able to avoid heat inactivated serum, uh, it's better for the cells in general just because it is more nutritious for the cells. Uh, but there's no real risks per se uh, when it comes to using heat inactivated or even uh, gamma sterilized FBS. Okay. Good, good. Um, 
Now, um, for this next question, you know, we were, we've we really had a, a big focus on cryopreserving cells, right? Um, let's sort of flip the script and talk instead about thawing. Can you um, clarify maybe a little bit uh, recommended thawing procedure of primary cells, some extent, and continuous cells to a greater extent? Okay. So... In general, the thawing is going to be fairly similar between the two. You want to thaw both both um, primary continuous cell lines in 37 degree water bath. Uh, it should be rapid. It shouldn't take any more than two minutes. Uh, basically, when you see a small to medium sized ice chunk remaining in the flask, it's usually ready to be handled. Um, and then after that, um, Re, uh, diluting the cells is actually another important part uh, in the thawing process because if you dilute the cells too rapidly, uh, what can happen is something called osmotic shock, uh, just the huge differences in osmolal uh, osmolality between the prior media, fresh media. Uh, it can have an, a significant effect on viability of the cells. So we definitely recommend odd cells dropwise to the fresh media after you thawed them. Um, and then from there, making sure you don't over centrifuge the cells. Um, you know, uh, for primary cells, we don't recommend centrifuging the cells because of how much more sensitive they are at the start of culture. But for continuous cell lines, uh, for nearly all of the cell lines that we have, we recommend 125 XG for 10 minutes. Um, you don't want to go too fast because the shear stresses that are introduced from centrifuge cycles uh, can cause some cells to life. Uh, can reduce viability. So 125 to 250 is generally the range that is, uh, 250 XG rather, is usually the range that we recommend. Uh, anything higher than that can definitely affect cells, uh, especially at the start of the culture. And then uh, if you have anything that else that you guys would want to add on to that as well. Okay. That, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so we've thawed the cells, we're growing the cells. Um, is contact inhibition a concern when culturing immortalized secondary cell lines? Uh, so in general, for most cells, um, you don't want to let them go to a full 100% confluence. Um, if not contact inhibition, then just, then just because, um, you know, when the cells run out of space to expand, they're going to enter into that lag phase of growth. Uh, so if they reach that high confluence, then subsequent subcultures are going to be growing a little bit slower. Um, and then, you know, it is going to vary from cell line to cell line, like how much they are affected by contact inhibition. Um, you know, some cell lines are not going to be, it's not going to be as much of a concern for some cell lines than it is for others. But uh, in general, like 80% confluence is a good place to, to um, subculture cells in general. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'd agree with all that. All right, um, Steve, I got a quickie for you. What is a COA? Oh, a COA, uh, that's a certificate of analysis. Uh, that contains uh, the information, like um, uh, a lot of what we talked about, like uh, marker information and your basic specifications and so forth, like um, you know viability that you would expect when thaw and so forth. And you get the C of A for each product page, there is a link on the product page which opens up and you you have to fill out the specific lot number of the vial with the product you're using because each CFA is lot to lot, it's specific for lot to lot. And you and it comes up as a PDF so you can print it out. But yeah, it's just the, um, yeah, just a certificate of analysis. All right, good, good. Now, um, Here's uh, one from Mike. Uh, would you recommend using the serum straight out of the fridge 
or let it get to room temperature by putting it in a warm bath or, you know, just living on the table um, for it to reach room temperature. Uh, so serum, in general, serum should be stored minus 20 or colder uh, for long-term storage. Uh, when you're using serum, uh, I guess I'm not, depends on what you're using the serum for. If you're just taking it out to aliquot it, you know, there's no real need to let it get, uh, to warm it up. Um, it's heating serum in a hot water bath is not going to be, you know, necessarily bad. You don't want to leave it in the hot water bath for, you know, hours or half an hour at a time. Um, if you are going to heat up serum in a hot water bath, you want to, uh, you know, let it heat up for as long, only as long as you need to, and then use it, um, you know, not let it sit in the hot water bath for too long. Um, but again, it's going to depend on what you need the serum for. Um, you know, if you're using it with cells, it's definitely worthwhile to let it warm up to the temperature that it's going to be need needed for uh, in the incubator. Uh, if you're using it to prepare solutions, uh, there's no real disadvantage to using it straight out of the fridge. Okay, so oh, that, that all makes sense. Um, now, speaking of serum, uh, is there a certain amount of serum that should be used um, for, I guess, to inactivate certain concentrations of trypsin? Um, so they followed up that they've never been told a specific amount just to add like 10 mil of media and that should be okay. Yep. I mean, so complete media is usually 5 to 10% FBS. Um, you know, 5, 5 to 10% FBS solutions is going to inactivate trips in uh, regard, like uh, either the 0 0.25 millimolar, I forget exactly what the concentrations are, but it should inactivate uh, standard trypsin and uh, the, the lighter trypsin that's used for primary cells. Uh, 5 to 10% should be fine. There's no real set amount, so to say. Yeah, yeah, I would agree okay. with that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, now, I guess the last question that um, we're, I'd like to uh, address is, how do you know how many cells to seed in your 12 centimeter squared flask? Um, do you have to titrate in the flask? Uh, how would you go about um, tackling that? And I'll shoot that, that my point. Small flask. Yeah, that is a small flask. Um, so it's going to vary cell line to cell line. So like with our primary cells, we have a pretty general recommendation of 5,000 cells per centimeter squared. So uh, if you're working with primary cells in a T12, that would be uh, 5,060,000 ,060, cells that would be needed for that, 60,000 viable cells. Mm -hmm. Um, for other cells that require, you know, like 30,000 cells per centimeter square, that could be upwards of 100,000. Uh, it is going to vary on cell line to cell line. Um, again, um, we have general seeding information that we recommend on the certificate of analysis for all of the lots that you would receive from ATCC. So that would be a good place to start. But again, it's going to vary pretty widely from cell line to cell line from primary cells to established cells. Okay, no, that sounds reasonable. All right, well, at this time, we will conclude our Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank Steve and Mike both for the excellent presentation and fielding all of your questions. And thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, one final word, we have webinars coming soon um, on February 16th. Uh, Kevin Grady will present, uh, oh, also in Kevin Tayo, ATCC's Toxicology Portfolio. Um, he'll give a uh, overview of all the tools that we have that you can use for every stage of preclinical development. Um, we also have on February uh, 23rd, uh, enable renal admi and pharmacokinetics using solute carrier transport cells. 
And then finally, on March 2nd, uh, 3D models for absorption and cosmetic toxicity studies, primary and immortalized epidermal cells. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.